aspects of uh, how the GCF has done and uh, how it can do better in the future. On that note, I'm going to go straight to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Selena Reiter, who's a senior advisor to the executive director, to talk about how we are taking into account some of these recommendations as we plan for the future, and then we can do a round of questions for both of them. Good afternoon, everyone. I know uh, there's been a bit of PowerPoint so far, but I hope you're still with us and interested because we're getting to the bit where we look into the future now. And I think uh, we've been very excited. Certainly, I've been very excited uh, from where I work in the office of the ED about how far we've actually been able to come as a fund uh, since February over the course of this year. And of course, the most major event uh, that happened for the GCF uh, this year was, of course, the successful conclusion of our first uh, replenishment process, uh, which culminated in a a pledging conference in Paris uh, just a little while ago. And of course, the, the outcome, we are still a small fund in the global finance landscape, but uh, if I flick to the next slide, was pledges of $9.777 billion from our contributors, uh, which you'll see on the slide here. We're very grateful to uh, for their signal of support and confidence in the fund, and also, of course, for capacitating us to continue our support to developing countries to take climate action. There is one contributor that is not on this slide uh, because they actually joined uh, the effort at our last board meeting, and that is Indonesia. Uh, in total, 28 countries have contributed so far to the GCF replenishment process. Uh, of that 28, half doubled or more than doubled their contributions, and around 80% actually increased their contributions. So we take that as a, a very positive signal uh, for the future of the fund. Just to, uh, again, look a bit into the future and at what this means in terms of our future programming in numbers, you can see on the slide there that, in effect, uh, during our initial period, which was five years of programming, we're programming on average a uh, billion dollars a year or 24 projects. Now, of course, that did scale up over time. Looking uh, at GCF1, if we realize all of the pledges uh, into contributions and, and commitment authority, we'd be looking at about $2.2 billion of programming per year. Uh, we've projected from a secretariat perspective that that's around 200, 250 uh, funding proposals, uh, which I think, given that we work with you know over 100, 150 developing countries, gives you some sense of the scale at which we're looking at programming going into that next period. And of course, uh, in addition to the funding proposal programming or new projects, we also have a sizable growth in the portfolio that we're implementing. So this slide is actually uh, also out of date uh, in terms of uh, the portfolio under implementation now, uh, 3.6 billion, but we're targeting uh, moving to having 90% of the portfolio under implementation by the end of the first replenishment period. Uh, Joe mentioned the strategic plan. Uh, this is something that the board is currently engaged in uh, effectively over the last year or so the board has been looking at a strategic planning process uh, where it's basically been focused on the, the point of how can the GCF actually support greater ambition, more impact in mitigation and adaptation action. So that's very much been at the heart of the GCF strategic planning process. Uh, this is a process that's evolved over our three board meetings this year. It's also a process that's involved submissions from our range of stakeholders, uh, from civil society, from the private sector, uh, as well as from our board members and obviously our countries, NDAs and accredited entities, and also informed by both the first performance review of the GCF and the outcomes of our replenishment process. And I think the key thing here, this is a process that is still ongoing. Our board hopes to conclude the strategic plan, which will be for the 2020 to 2023 period by its next board meeting in March uh, 2020. So to give you a sense, and I think this comes actually back to the, the question that was raised earlier of the directions that are emerging in the strategic planning process, though of course it is one that is still ongoing under the guidance of our board. This is to give you a sense of where the GCF's heading. So really our overall strategic vision is to promote paradigm shift uh, in developing countries towards low emissions, climate resilient development, and more specifically to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement. 
and that includes countries' NDCs, their nationally determined contribution their national adaptation plans and other national climate efforts. And really to organize our thinking around that vision, we're thinking about what are the goals and results uh, that GCF can achieve through the next programming period by 2023. And that, as you see on the slide, is focused very much about how we can deliver more ambitious impact for developing countries according to their priorities. It's also going to set out uh, what we see as the programming strategy and as you'll see on the slide, the heart of the idea of this is country-driven transformational programming. So it's very important that as a fund, we're country-driven. We don't come up with programs. We don't come up with sectoral programs uh, ourselves. We do very much uh, take uh, listen to basically the country's priorities and facilitate that. And what we want to do is be able to support countries to kind of think into the long term, to think about 2020, 2050, what their emissions profile might be, what their vulnerabilities might be, and then come to us with the projects that are gonna have the most impact for them. So the most transformational projects for them. And from a GCF side, we would take additional efforts to facilitate this uh, by doing our own thinking, by working with sectoral experts and coming up with guidance that can actually help countries uh, through that programming process. And then finally, last but absolutely not least, as it's been stressed, uh, we're very conscious that we need to improve the efficiency, effectiveness, speed and transparency of our processes and the strategic plan, as well as both the work of the Secretariat and the Board, are looking at a range of measures as to how we can improve the business model and how we can improve the way we operate, basically to be able to deliver uh, faster, smarter and stronger. Oh, the final slide I'll end on, I'll just put it all up. Uh, maybe the words are a bit small, but it really comes to the question uh, that was asked earlier, which is what is our theory of change? How do we see the fund actually uh, striving to deliver paradigm shift, working with developing countries and working with accredited entities? And you'll see on there really five components of this, the idea of building countries' own capacity for transformational programming and really utilizing our readiness resources that you heard about from Javier and project preparation resources to be able to build that national capacity. How we then actually uh, strive for projects and support pro uh, countries to bring projects that show innovation that show the potential for really tackling climate issues uh, within national or regional contexts and that have the potential to be replicated and scaled up. Then how do we, as a, as a public fund, uh, be, uh, how are we able to then catalyze broader climate finance, uh, basically also shift broader finance flows into climate action, uh, into these successful models of projects. And then finally, what can we learn from all of that to allow and enable others to effectively replicate those interventions? The fifth and final pillar, of course, being what I talked about earlier, which is how do we improve ourselves as an organization? And just a couple of points I think to end with, I'm trying to make this presentation a little fast because I know we're behind time. Really what we're focused on there as GCF in terms of efficiency and effectiveness is uh, four things. I would say first, streamlined processes. We're very conscious of the need to streamline our processes. Uh, Joe provided some data on uh, FAA, which is the project agreement uh, signings and the length of time uh, it had been taking to do them. We're very proud to say that at our last board meeting, we were able to sign three project agreements immediately after the board approval. So that shows uh, how we're actually changing our processes, moving the timing of things around to be able to deliver uh, faster. And we've actually moved from, I think, having 50 FAAs effective uh, early in the er earlier in the year to having over 70 uh, effective and over 80 signed within the last few months. So that's really speeding up. The other points were, of course, trying to give clearer guidance uh, to countries and to our entities, really to make sure that efforts are invested where they're going to have impact. I think in the early stage of the fund, uh, we were building the plane while flying it. Uh, so we were kind of flying blind. 
and one of the efforts we'll be doing is actually uh, trying to be more transparent and clear about that GCF guidance. Also improving transparency, hopefully through using web applications uh, so people can track the status of their applications as they're coming through. And then finally through rationalizing our policy uh, agenda. And the board has just adopted a four year work plan which will actually uh, kind of rationalize and systematize the consideration of future policy changes. I'll leave it there uh, because I know we're short on time, but of course you can, as Javier highlighted, find the latest information uh, about GCF performance times updated, I think through to near the end of the year in our IRM report uh, through the link. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Selena, for that presentation. Uh, we're a little bit, uh, we have a little bit more than 30 minutes left in the session, and I want to move to the, the three panelists we have who represent uh, the GCF's partners. Uh, but I'll just give it a minute or two to see if there's any burning questions for either Selena or Ms. Puri. I see two hands, we'll take that and then we'll, or three, we'll take all three and then we will move to the panelists. Thank you very much for this very interesting insight into the GCF. Um, I was wondering, um, actually this is a question to both speakers because both of you have been mentioning the paradigm shifts and I was wondering um, which are the underlying criteria that you did use in both the evaluation and also which are used um, in the portfolio creation. And a second question would be about scale. Um, do you think it could be more effective to address more um, small scale um, entities and also smaller projects in the implementation? Thank you. Underlying criteria and scale, we'll come to that. Uh, there was a gentleman right there, yeah. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I'm Lucas for, uh, from UCL, University College London. I have a question regarding um, whether the GCF has considered to um, pilot or use distributed led ledger technologies as a way to uh, increase efficiency and the disbursement of funds. Thank you. Okay, distributed ledger technologies. One last one and then we'll come to the panelists. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Mobabe from GET. I'm just going through the GCF projects now and I discovered that there is none on climate change and health. So I want to know, can GCF fund a project on climate change and health, or there are sectors that GCF are focused on? Droughts, all right. So let's come back to the panelists. Uh, question about droughts, question about disputed ledger, underlying criteria, and um, scale. So quickly, Selena and, and Joe. Uh, on paradigm shift, I think it is important that we do look at this in a country context. Um, so that comes back to the earlier question. We do look at it sort of, is it paradigm shifting in the context of the country or region? Uh, but what we are doing is actually using the theory of change that you see on this slide also to look at that question of paradigm shift. So is the intervention helping the country advance planning uh, that will unlock action in a sector? Is it demonstrating a new innovation in terms of a practice, uh, a use of indigenous uh, knowledge, um, a business model, for example, uh, within that sector? Is it showing a pathway to sustainability? So we actually use this, I guess, this theory and we look at then what it means in a country or a regional context. Uh, for scale, I think this slide actually also answers that question because there is value in terms of funding in both looking at smaller projects uh, potentially that can demonstrate innovation and be replicated, but also looking at projects that can achieve that broader financing. And it just depends on which country you're working in, which sector you're working in, as to which uh, intervention may be most impactful and have paradigm shifting effect uh, in that sector. I'll try to take the, the distributed ledger question 
you're meeting blockchain and other technologies. Uh, yes, we are looking at it. I can't say any more than that because I can't claim personally to understand what the potentials of application are for the GCF, but we have certainly had uh, presentations and discussions internally uh, on that. And the question on health, I think this is something we're focused on going into the next uh, programming period. One of the, I think the challenges with health is that health tends not to come as a standalone project. Uh, it, it's about encouraging how do you take the health implications into account when you're doing health infrastructure, when you're doing water projects, when you're looking at emissions and air pollutions. And uh, I think our experience suggests we haven't yet found the right partnerships to sort of bring those health uh, projects through, but that's something we'd like to work on for the next programming period with our countries and AEs. Joe, on the first set of questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll take the transformational change question, and I'm also going to encourage you to take a, uh, take a look at one of our learning papers that we've done on transformational change. It's also on our website. Uh, uh, when, when we looked at transformational change, we looked at four different attributes. And so we've done actually quite a bit of work, both looking at the GCF portfolio itself, as well as conceptually and four different attributes that if you look across all of the agencies and experiences um, that are necessary but not sufficient for transformational change. One is that there has to be scale. So whether it's at the level of the globe or at the level of the country, there has to be scale. Second, there has to be depth of change. So if you're just making, for example, in education, a 0.5% change, that's very small given that baselines are usually very high, right? So you want to make a big, change in depth and that's depths of change the third is there has to be an enabling environment so policy environment has to change as well and the fourth is that you have to think about behavior that's the last mile those are necessary conditions for any transformation to ch occur but of course transformation is a discontinuous function so you have to think about that step function or that jump and in many cases, you're not able to predict it, but you should be able to say whether it's likely to occur or not. So that's the subject of another study that we do have online as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Selena and uh, Ms. Puri. We're now gonna move to our panelists and we'll come back at the end of uh, their interventions to the audience. Uh, so let me start by introducing each of them and then I will pose the first question to them. So I have, uh, uh, let me start with introducing Ambassador Fituri, uh, who's, uh, who's the um, permanent representative of Samoa to the United Nations in New York. Um, he has represented the Pacific Islands sits on our board previously and is a strong advocate and voice of those countries uh, with the GCF. I also have uh, to his right, uh, Ms. Aisatu Sila, who's the head of climate finance at Santo de Suvi Ecologic, uh, which is um, accredited entity of the GCF, a direct access accredited entity of the GCF, uh, which is focused for the GCF that we uh, increasingly work through direct access entities. And last but not least, I also have uh, Ms. Amelie Amin, who is the Chief of the Climate Change and Sustainability Division of the Inter-American Development Bank. They are an international accredited entity of the GCF and an important partner that helps the GCF uh, undertake things at scale. Um, so what I'm going to do is ask the first question and have them all three reflect on this first question uh, and then we can uh, come back to the next one. So you've all had experience working with the GCF um, can you share with the audience what that experience has been like from the from the vantage point of your your uh, position, and what have been some of the key lessons that you have learned uh, in working with the GCF? So maybe starting with you, Ambassador Fituri, and then we'll go to the others. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a believer in the saying that it's the shoe that, uh, it's the foot that wears the shoe that knows best whether the shoe fits or not. Not the salesperson will come and say, it looks nice on you, ambassador. And yet it's either too loose, too tight, or maybe it just fits. 
So I represent the foot that wears the shoe. Let me just say that uh, if there were any ask that I took with me when I served on a transitional committee that designed the governing instrument of the fund, it was one, we need certainty. Two, we also need choices. Three, we need help to allow us to access the resources. And I think fortunately, the governing instrument was able to respond and reflect on those asks. So that's why, for instance, in, uh, in terms of uh, certainty, we have the, the minimum uh, floor in allocation of allocation resources for, for vulnerable countries, including states. In terms of uh, accessing Jeff resources, you can do it regionally, uh, nationally, or through international AEs. And in terms of uh, operational modalities, you have the simplified approval process. And in terms of funding windows, we have the adaptation mitigation. And uh, we also have the readiness support to help uh, resource constrained countries to be able to come forward with uh, funding proposals. And I think for me, my message from day one to my constituency has been that Green Climate Fund is our fund. It is here to stay, but you also need to try and uh, move away from the old narrative where, where some of us are so wedded to. And I think that old narrative is that sometimes it's too difficult to access resources. Sometimes there are no uh, climate resources. So I think my message all along has been to try and ensure that there is a change in mindset. Because if uh, Tuvalu with a population of 11,000, is able to access 37 million grant funding, then there is something wrong from those people who are complaining. Moreover, if even when we were given the simplified approval process, because some of us were complaining that we were resource constrained, it was difficult to access. And yet, of the 12 uh, SAP projects that I've approved so far, none of it is from a small island developing state. So there's something wrong somewhere. I said to my colleagues, or oh, maybe 10 million is very insignificant amount now for states. They need more than that. But I just want to share that I think these are the real experiences that we're going through. And uh, so it's, uh, it's important to have a change in mindset. It's important to know that uh, we are both sides of the same coin. Moreover, I think uh, it's also important to realize that uh, TCF will benefit from uh, very constructive uh, suggestions rather than keeping on saying it's very difficult because at the end of the day, even in your own national governments, you can't just walk in and say to your Ministry of Finance, give us a thousand because I need to travel to the other island. No, no. You have uh, procedures to, uh, to adhere to. You have paperwork to fill in. So I think we need to make a connection in terms of our narrative and what's happening on the ground. So that's why for me, it was a privilege to be on the board on the transitional committee, because I can then try and relate this to my people. And I think the taste, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. And that's the yardstick I, uh, for me, I can measure whether the, the, the Pacific are taking advantage of the fund. Truth be told, as of now, 12 out of 14, 10 out of 14 countries have funding proposals that have already been approved to the tune of over $300 million. That's a lot of money. And that's roughly close to 80 million a year. And the majority of it is for adaptation projects with one or, with one or two for cross-cutting issues. So for me, when I go and listen and hear people complaining all the time, I say, Green Climate Fund is the Pacific's fund. Why? Because it is there to help us. And I think it's good to know too that the level of confidence is still rising. And that's been demonstrated in terms of the replenishment uh, that has been uh, undertaken recently. What's not been mentioned is that a lot of countries are doubling their contributions. For me, that's a vote of confidence. So I'm sorry I have to dash off. I have another engagement. That's a strong vote of confidence for the Green Climate Fund, for the contributors, and also for those who are benefiting. 
And I have to keep on reminding everything in life is relative. We talk about transformational because it's fashionable to talk about it. We talk about paradigm shift. What does it mean? A $10 million funding, a $10 million project can have transformational impact for a community in the Pacific who had never had electricity before, who had never had clean water supply. So everything in life is relative. So I think it's important for us to try and be as supportive as possible, but more importantly, to try and help by being creative and by being uh, constructive in what we say, rather than insisting on giving us a blank check as if you can do that in your own family or in your own government or in your own organization. So all the best. And uh, thank you also for the opportunity no, to, to share with uh, colleagues here that uh, we have a, uh, no, that the Green Climate Fund is doing excellent work for the very people that it was set up to do, those at the front line of the impacts of climate change. I thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Faturi, for that word of confidence. And we, we understand if you if you have to leave. Um, let, let's now move to uh, Africa, uh, a direct access entity from a least developed country. Uh, Isatu, what has been your experience and what have you learned? Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, and sorry for my broken English. Uh, I want at first to thank uh, the Green Climate Fund to have associated the CAC uh, in this event. Uh, as you know, uh, CAC uh, is a direct access entity and is uh, engaged with the GCF uh, since 2015. And in terms of achievement, we have already developed our entity work program by 2022 and uh, in the pipe we have six projects uh, the one project is approved and the FAA is already seen and uh, we have uh, uh, two uh, one one sub project uh, in uh, a stage of development and our goal is to to, to send it uh, uh, by the end of the year. And uh, we have two concept not already approved by the Green Climate Fund uh, and uh, for which we request the PPF. Uh, the PPF is already signed to the DA, uh, to the NDA uh, for the no objection letter. And we have two concept not uh, under development. And uh, related to the GCF uh, uh, readiness uh, 1.0, uh, CAC uh, uh, is a partner for uh, in six country, countries, Senegal, uh, Chad, Djibouti, uh, GRC, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, okay, and Chad, and for, for four of which were completed and Djibouti and Ivory Coast is in the in progress. Uh, CEC also received a grant from GCF to uh, strengthen institutional capacity uh, in financial management, uh, m &E, uh, project development procedure, uh, gender mainstreaming and safeguarding uh, external audit. And uh, CEC is also very involved in the uh, community uh, of practice for direct access entity and uh, we put this uh, this initiative uh, since 2016 and the purpose is to provide a venue for knowledge exchanges learning and experience sharing collaboration and peer support within the with within the community of uh, direct access entity involved in the programming of climate change adaptation and mitigation finance. Uh, in terms of uh, lessons learned and next step, uh, has a delivery partner. Uh, we think that the delivery partner work goes beyond the management of the financial resources of the program. Uh, if we take our case, uh, we. We are involved in the review and validation of 
the various products and deliverable. And we need also to mobilize human resources and expert working time that is not taken in account in our management fees. The other point related to the readiness uh, 1.0 is a need for, multi uh, for multidisciplinary expertise because the tasks are different and, and it is very difficult to find a single consultant capable of having all the required skills. Uh, for the need in the uh, project development, we think that it will be better uh, to have a technical assistant, but when we receive an uh, expert, we, we, we need to have it uh, at, at least three or six months, because one, on, one, in, our, uh, one in, in one hour project, we receive the technical assistant, but the, the consultant said in, uh, stay in CS uh, since one week, and we think that it's not, uh, it's not enough to, to bring all support we need. For the next step, in order to continue developing and implementing this work program, our work program has well has scaled it to meet a growing challenge of climate change in Senegal and beyond. There are a number of specific, uh, specific next steps that CSC will work to address specifically, working with the partner and partners and the UCF to finalize the current project in the pipeline and identify new opportunities for project development in Senegal and beyond, particularly exploring ideas connected to other mitigation adaptation priorities not yet represented in CSE's portfolio today. The other point is uh, levering uh, the GCF capacity building grant to upscaling, to upscale CSE's institutional capacity and build toward high, high le higher level of accreditation with the Green Climate Fund to enable CSE to develop more expensive climate programming in Senegal. The other point is the expanding CSE's rule has a rational partner to other organizations and countries working to develop projects for the GCF by continuing to support readiness and capacity building. Leverage CSE's experience and success with the Green Climate Fund to document and share incident and lessons learned for the project development process and collaborating the drive opportunities for broader regional project and program with the GCF. And the, uh, the, the final point is to see how CSC can manage the implementation of NAPS. That's the some point I want to share with you. And sorry for my bad English. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Sila. I think uh, CSC exemplifies uh, what a direct access entity can do. Uh, they've been able to access diverse parts of the GCF and uh, have made much progress and therefore the rich lessons as well. Um, let me now turn to Ms. Uh, Amin uh, from the IDB. Uh, a very different institution, different part of the world, but what's been your experience? Thank you. So I think, well, we've had a long partnership now with the GCF. Uh, we were one of the first um, uh, accredited entities in uh, July 2015 at the very first uh, board meeting. Um, but I think as we've heard from um, the evaluation, um, that wasn't, uh, that didn't mean we were fully accredited. So we did have, and in fact, I think it was fairly consistent with the findings. Um, we, I think, we we, we we were also the first multilateral development bank to take our, get our accredited, um, uh, accredited accreditation master agreement approved at the GCF board uh, in December 2017. Uh, although we took a little bit longer to get it approved at our board, we did actually make it effective very early, which I'll come back to because I think we took a risk there, which didn't pay off in many respects. Um, but of course, we were all learning by doing. I think it was really great to hear the recommendation that uh, moving forward, it cannot be a one-size-fits-all. 
because if there was one thing that I think made our negotiation around the AMA, the legal agreement, was at that point then the assumption that one size would fit all and that an AMA would work uh, similar for multilateral development bank where we have um, very um, uh, formal governance, uh, very formal uh, policies, um, uh, strong safeguards, you know, all of these things that we could have a similar AMA to a very small NGO. And I think there was, you know, understanding that that wasn't really going to work, but we, we didn't, we, we, we didn't manage to really progress uh, for, for the first, I would say two years, actually, we lost quite a lot of time. Once that understanding was um, uh, reached, then we moved pretty quickly, actually, in, in finalizing the AMA. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a very, uh, I myself even got involved, I'm not one of our lawyers, but it was a very positive construction, constructive um, engagement. And so we were very happy with that. Um, we did, and I'll just come back to, uh, we, as I said, we, we made our, we triggered our AMA, it went effective uh, pretty quickly, and before we actually had the financial um, agreements for some of the projects, our first project was approved in October 2015. Uh, again, we took some risks. I think some of our colleagues didn't take so many risks. They they waited to get their AMAs in place before they took projects. We actually decided, no, let's 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 move quickly. We want to really take, uh, you know, to to you know move the agenda forward in partnership with the Green Climate Fund. Um, that project, unfortunately, a program that was a very innovative private sector project, um, in the end got uh, cancelled, timed out, which was unfortunate, but. Um, you know, I think in retrospect, we had we known about the timeline to get the AMA, then probably that wasn't the right type of project to take. So I think, although you didn't talk about the private sector facility, I think the recommendations that you've you've um, here, I, I think, are excellent because um, I think for the private sector facility that it, to work with the private sector, which uh, we don't now anymore. At IDB, IDB Invest, our, our sister organisation during the whole process, and this was a complication on our side as well, we had a merge out, um, which made also a couple of things tricky uh, to deal with on our side regarding this one project that had been approved in October 2015. Um, but uh, the private sector facility will need to be nimble, really, if it is to really uh, engage with the private sector, because um, these projects move much, much faster uh, than, um, than they do with governments. So I think it was great to hear the findings evaluation, I think very much reflect uh, uh, the experience we had and, and fully uh, support the, the recommendations, particularly this one size fits all, of course, impact without a doubt uh, and speed. And we, I think, uh, would love to see um, moving forward, uh, I think the recommendation around ensuring much greater certainty and predictability around the timeline of projects. Because, I mean, me and my team in, in the Inter-American Development Bank, we don't tend to uh, deliver these projects ourselves, but we work and we partner with different parts of our bank, but different parts of the organization. We have to be uh, bringing them to the table bringing them, encouraging them to say, bring the most innovative projects, bring the, you know, where we really have a paradigm shift. And our credibility with them <laughs> gets undermined if uh, the timeline is not necessarily, it, it, I mean, it could be a long, relatively long timeline if there, if there was predictability. And I think that's, that's the, probably the key here, having greater predictability, but also in turn, our relationship with our clients, with our governments in particular, because they uh, rely on us to have that conversation on their behalf. And I just want to summarize very quickly the projects we do have. We're really happy with the projects we've started to disperse um, uh, uh, in two of the projects. Um, but I just want to emphasize three of our projects are with national development banks. So those national development banks in El Salvador, Paraguay, Argentina, I mean, they can and probably and hopefully will become um, direct access accredited entities. But they um, working with us actually enables them to benefit from our expertise as well as potentially 
co-financing alongside the GCF. So actually, uh, we hear from them <laughs> that they want to partner with us. So I think it is important. And Latin America has many, most countries in the region have strong national development banks, but they don't in the most part have strong uh, climate portfolios. And where they do, and I would say in Mexico, and in fact, this was a project I worked on through the climate investment funds back in 2008 with NAFIN, the Mexican um, National Development Bank, you know, they, they they, they are learning, they are now. I mean, Nafin is probably one of the National Development Bank champions on this agenda. 10 years ago, they had absolutely no, no people inside the organization that actually understood what these projects might might look like. So it's a learning by doing a learning process. And I, we, we at the IDB do think um, our role in, in engaging with the GCF with National Development Banks is really important. Our other project, a regional program, um, one in the Eastern Caribbean, a geothermal program, sustainable energy facility is working with the Caribbean Development Bank, um, with Eastern Caribbean state that are not our client countries. But again, we really, uh, there's, we see a lot of value and I think the Caribbean Development Bank sees a lot of value of that partnership uh, engagement in developing this program. And that will hopefully um, deliver private sector investments in geothermal um, that will have very positive benefits, not only in terms of climate, but reducing the need for oil imports and you know, very expensive um, uh, fuel uh, compared to the economies of these very, very small islands. And then the other uh, two uh, in Central America, one is um, looking at how to promote sustainable agricultural practices. And then in Guatemala and Mexico, building on um, our experience already in, in that area and really trying to bring more private sector solutions for micro, micro enterprises. So very small. It's a shame the ambassador left because I agree that yes, we need to deliver scale, but that of course is relative and actually really, um, you know, working with micro enterprises, you don't need a lot of money for it to be scale there. And finally, Honduras, where this was the most recent project approved. And I think it really demonstrates what I, I believe we'll see a lot more demand for in our region because it's focused on uh, forest restoration and improving um, uh, watersheds and forests that are really needed to ensure water, um, uh, effective water supply as countries like Honduras are being affected by climate change. And, and that for me, and I wasn't sure if the gentleman mentioned health or drought, but that project is about addressing drought very much, but it also brings uh, very other strong benefits fits in terms of uh, uh, reforestation, which also is about uh, carbon uh, uh, mitigation. So a mitigation and adaptation project, which I think we'll see increasingly the need for moving forward. Thank you very much, uh, Amelie. Uh, uh, for sharing uh, your experience as uh, IDB with the GCF. We've learned some things but we've done quite a bit of things, quite diverse set of things. Um, I know we'd like the conversation to continue. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So if you have any questions for the speakers, I'm going to encourage you to take them up, uh, take it up with them personally. And before uh, I close, I just want to also uh, announce a few other events that we have. Uh, one later today, it's the Green Champions Award. It will be at the GCF uh, uh, Pavilion, which is in Hall. 8 at 6 15 p.m and next week oh there will be drinks too so uh, if you if you're not a champion you'll at least get drinks um and next week on wednesday uh, december 11th we have two events one jointly with the global environment facility at 1 15 uh, PM, which is looking at how we work in a coordinated way uh, uh, to help countries achieve the NDC goals in the next cycle. And uh, uh, another event of just a GCF at 3 PM. Both these events will be in this room uh, on raising ambition and empowering action as we uh, look to the GCF's first replenishment period. So you're welcome to join those events and also please spread the word to your colleagues. And a big round of thank you to all of the speakers and panelists uh, for their contributions.